afternoon to everybody. Let me to welcome you all to our online debate on shortfalls of the Eastern Partnership uh, in South Caucasus. My name is Petros Ostrovichus. I am a member of European Parliament elected in Lithuania. I belong to Renew Europe Group, which is a centrist uh, liberal group. I'm a member of uh, Foreign Affairs Committee and in particular having a great interest in uh, Eastern Partnership strategy and policies around. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very excellent opportunity to uh, analyze, to debate, and hopefully to agree on uh, some issues which kept us so busy during the last two months. Uh, a military conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, or Armenia and Azerbaijan, was very much in focus of many, many minds and uh, people uh, during the last two months. To, uh, two months, and not just two months. Uh, this is a, a protracted uh, frozen conflict uh, from time to time having even a hot uh, uh, stages uh, as well. Um, the South uh, Caucasus is, is a very particular place uh, to which um, the European Union devotes uh, lots of attention and interest. Uh, you know that uh, Georgia is having uh, associated countries uh, status, uh, Armenia, uh, already finalized uh, negotiations on uh, uh, economic cooperation agreement with the U European Union. Azerb uh, Azerbaijan is advancing towards uh, uh, in negotiations with the European Union, not probably in a speedy way, uh, having own interest in this regard. But nevertheless, there is a certain presence of uh, European Union uh, in uh, in the region and some and all countries i mean in question georgia uh, armenia and azerbaijan have very different strategies probably and expectations towards the european union uh, uh, re relationship some think about the membership some are less ambitious and it's up to them to decide but nevertheless uh, we have many many different sectorial and um, horizontal agreements with those countries but of course, our focus should be what happened uh, and what will happen after this military conflict, which has changed the uh, geopolitical situation in, in the region so much, uh, with the great involvement of Turkey, with uh, interesting configuration uh, policies of Russia. So we have probably to uh, examine the situation after the military conflict, not from the military point of view, but from the geopolitical point of view. What does it mean in terms of the European Union? I was a very uh, tough uh, critic uh, of European Union's policies uh, in, uh, during this conflict. I was uh, urging uh, the European Union to take more proactive uh, uh, position to get involved in, uh, uh, in uh, settling this military conflict, in ceasefire, achieving ceasefire, in presenting uh, um, kind of uh, a good, uh, good offer on, on, on the right time in order to stop hostilities and to start uh, reconciliation and finally to, uh, to agree on the, um, uh, on the ceasefire. I mean, what has achieved this? I mean, uh, officially, it's Russia. What is the European Union? What, what is left of the European Union involvement in South Caucasus? This uh, kind of uh, rhetorical question will remain uh, uh, during this debate probably from, from the start to, to the end. And ladies and gentlemen, this is my really pleasure since tonight we have very excellent set of speakers uh, representing uh, region in, uh, in question, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, as well as coming from Turkey and Russia. Since all those countries are very part of uh, recent events in, uh, in South Caucasus. And uh, let me to introduce you one by one and uh, giving uh, a floor to speak. Let's agree that each of you in a first part in 30 minutes, first 30 minutes will be given five minutes to speak, leaving a good time for our debate and Q&A session. I will start from uh, Dr. Leila Aliyeva, is a Russian and East European studies uh, affiliate at the Oxford School for Global and Area Studies. She's originally from Azerbaijan, 
He has founded and directed uh, two think tanks in Baku. Her research and publications cover Azerbaijan, the Caucasus, Russia, and the broader former uh, Soviet Union, and range thematically from energy security to conflicts to democracy in the oil-rich states, as well as issues around integration into uh, the European Union, meaning Eastern Partnership uh, policies and NATO. Madam Alieva, floor is yours. Five minutes is on your account. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this um, uh, initiative because I think Thank it's you. actual. I totally agree with your assessment that you could have been more active because uh, this um, situation which we are now basically is the best or most uh, bright uh, demonstration of what happens if uh, the West as an actor is weak or is not present in the region. So this gap is immediately filled by the regional actors. And uh, it also shows uh, the threats and risks uh, which pose the unresolved frozen conflicts. Um, it may sort of uh, indicate what can we expect in any part of the frozen conflict um, in the FSU. I would say that uh, it should also viewed, this uh, conflict should viewed in the context of the um, uh, 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 countries of the region and uh, Russia, because for 30 years, Azerbaijan has been resisting Russian pressure to locate its troops, border troops, uh, peacekeeping troops and bases on Azerbaijan's territory, but it was consistently rejected because this is a very basics of the restoration of the modern nation state uh, from the point of view of Azerbaijan, and it should not and could not have been compromised at all and under any conditions. But it seems that certain uh, developments. Uh, led to the review uh, of this uh, sort of basic uh, premise. Uh, and um, uh, what I uh, consider very important is the normative uncertainty which was created in the security area, in particular in Karabakh conflict, when on the one hand one international organization issues certain uh, normative regulations like re UN resolutions. On the other hand, the other international organization actually uh, incorporates uh, the military gains uh, into the negotiation process and that and does not legitimize the military gains, which basically sends the message to the parties of the conflict that the more you get as a result of military gains, the more you can get as a result of bargaining process. So it opens the doors and legitimizes the military way of resolution of the conflict. Besides, Azerbaijan had a permanent pressure of the humanitarian emergency caused by the situation of occupation of its um, 20% of the territory, which is uh, 700,000 IDPs, and uh, almost every tenth of the country is IDP or refugee, and it's enormous pressure, in particular, which showed itself during the July violation of the ceasefire, when the uh, multi-thousand um, rally took many people in the street, and it was a serious signal that this issue should be addressed um, immediately. Also, uh, the countries didn't lose time um, of the frozen um, period. They were arm, uh, arming and uh, Azerbaijan was diver uh, diversifying the sources of its uh, 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 arms supplies and uh, partners. Um, on the other hand, uh, the COVID also creates the uh, good conditions for uh, military way as way of destruction for basically all the actors who are involved in this um, situation without exception. And uh, 44 uh, 
uh, they were, as it's called, uh, called now in Azerbaijan, uh, basically uh, made the winners, um, first of all, these 700,000 refugees and IDPs who will have a chance now to go back to the liberated territories. And you can't even imagine how much excitement and happiness is around because you, uh, I myself, I didn't expect that there are so many of them are originally from those regions. Many civil society actors, many politicians, many uh, opposition activists, many of them are from this uh, displaced, uh, they are displaced from these regions. Um, However, what was absolutely unexpected for majority of uh, Azerbaijanis is bringing in Russian troops. Um, there is uh, definitely a discrepancy in assessment of bringing Russian troops in. First, for the majority of the active society and population, it is a major departure from the very substance and essence of Azerbaijan as a modern nation state in the post-Soviet period, because for Azerbaijan, the freedom from Russia is freedom to get integrated in the West, freedom to uh, develop democracy, freedom to develop um, its own uh, sort of resources and uh, so on, and integration in the civilized world. Uh, on the other hand, um, there is some positive assessment, but it's a much less uh, amount of uh, number of population, mainly elite, um, because they consider that this is temporary, this is a tactical, uh, tactical step, and the presence of Turkey as a new actor in the region is actually balancing the Russian presence in the, uh, on the territory. The major assessment, however, is increasing Russia influence, not only on Azerbaijan and Armenia, but also in the Caucasus as a whole. It gives Russia an upper hand uh, through peacekeeping troops to undermine any project which might take place uh, in the region, uh, whether it's energy project, infrastructure project, you know, any other economic project or even political projects. It has now direct uh, possibility of direct influence both on domestic situation in Azerbaijan and indirect uh, uh, influence on both Armenia and Azerbaijan through the possibility of stirring the conflict. Uh, let me stop here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Alieva, uh, for your introductory remarks. We move uh, immediately to Dr. Stepan Grigorian, who is a chairman uh, of the board uh, at the Analytical Center on Globalization and Regional Cooperation based in Yerevan. Uh, previously, he was involved in the political world of Armenia, served uh, as a member of national parliament, uh, as me too. It's good to see you, colleague. Uh, as advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and other diplomatic positions. Uh, Mr. Grigorian, floor is yours. Please observe five minutes uh, uh, time limits. Thank you. Uh, dear Petros, thank you very much for this initiative. It's a very important initiative. And I have to say that Azerbaijan unleashed the war in September of this year with enormous support, including military support by Turkey and with the involvement of quite a large number of mercenaries from Syria. These are commonly known facts. They unleashed the war against the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and against Armenia. And they happened to win this war. At least I would say they partially won this war. So what's interesting for specialists here who are dealing with conflicts is that usually when they uh, enforce peace, they usually uh, enforce peace upon the aggressor, the initiator of the war. But here we have an interesting situation. They enforced peace on the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and on Armenia, the Republic of Armenia. 
I have to say, unfortunately, there was also ethnic cleansing in that Azerbaijan was bombing massively Armenian towns and villages. One thing is one bomb is another to, to mass bombing. So out of 150,000 people from Nagorno-Karabakh, about 100,000 are currently refugees. And the second question, which is very important, which we all have to think about today, unfortunately, even after November 9, after the agreement, we see cruelty, cruel behavior in Azerbaijan towards Armenians, Armenian prisoners of war. We see uh, driving Armenians out of their villages. And this is a serious problem. It's still happening as we speak. Well, the second thing, what can this agreement do? Nothing good for Armenia or for Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. The reason is simple. It was an agreement written by the Russians with huge pressure from Turkey. So pay attention. Armenia is now pulling troops out of the seven regions around Nagorno-Karabakh. But nobody is saying a word about the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. But if you look at the Madrid principles of the Minsk group of the OSCE, it refers to status as well. So Armenians are not getting anything in Nagorno-Karabakh yet. But what happened is that uh, it's currently impossible to ensure durable peace. The integrity of Nagorno-Karabakh has been breached Nagorno-Karabakh, the autonomy in Soviet Socialist Azerbaijan, it was one unit. Now it's divided into two parts. Shushi and Hadrut are uh, given to Azerbaijan. Three of the remaining regions are in Nagorno-Karabakh. So the integrity of Nagorno-Karabakh has been breached, which is very strange. In the Hadrut district, for example, Azerbaijans have never lived in their history never so it's very strange if this is peace if this is settlement now turning to the osc minsk group and the role of the europeans including france and the usa this whole agreement was done by circumventing the osc minsk group so it's russia and turkey really getting a decision as I understand it, French and American diplomats learned about that statement later, even than we experts in Armenia did, or experts in Azerbaijan or experts in Georgia. So there was no role in this agreement, and this is very bad because the Madrid principles provide for the human rights as well. They provide for the right to life, they provide for the right to a decent life, and so on. Unfortunately, these components all dropped out because Turkey and Russia are not the kind of countries for which life of a human being is a priority. So now, what should be done? I would propose to the Europeans sharply raising the issue of status of Nagorno-Karabakh, not primitive, tomorrow's independence or something else the day after tomorrow. But that's very important because if Europe and the United States of America recognize even an interim status of Nagorno-Karabakh today, I'm afraid we lost uh, interpretation. Didn't we? I hear nothing. Andres, I, I hear nothing. Uh, problems with in interpretation. Yeah. Are we, uh, oh. Go on. Yeah, please. Okay, we will be back to uh, uh, Mr. Grigoriana after this because I mean he used already five minutes and uh, others should follow. Uh, I ask Mr. Grigoriana I mean to, to be back okay, uh, with some additional this points uh, in our Q&A session. Now we move to Ambassador uh, Georgi 
Badridze, who is a senior fellow at the Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies, uh, Rondeli Foundation. Previously, he served as ambassador of Georgia to the United Kingdom uh, from uh, um, the beginning of uh, 2000 and among other public uh, service positions. Uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Astervichus, um, and also your team for organizing this discussion at, and for having me. Uh, can I please start with the <clears throat> um, Georgian view on the Eastern Partnership? Uh, we believe it was a very noble idea, uh, reflecting the interests um, and the values of European societies. And I think it is only logical that the EU wants stable and uh, uh, prosperous neighbors as, as much as possible, and ideally democratic ones. And we've seen uh, in a number of years uh, sustained efforts to help these countries to achieve greater democracy, greater economic prosperity, and interconnectivity with the European Union. And, and those countries uh, which were willing to accept uh, the European help, I mean, they have achieved certain progress. I mean, uh, this program, the partnership was principally, in principle, can say, as successful as the recipient countries were willing or able to, to take the help from the European Union. Um, we saw the visa-free movement, which is great. Uh, we have, uh, well, at least Georgia, uh, deep and comprehensive free trade, which is super. Another matter is to what degree Georgia has used the opportunity. However, here's a problem. And this should start with a disclaimer. Every time I speak about Russia, I have to say that um, I should not be accused of Russophobia, as very often some of our Russian friends do, uh, with regard to everyone who dares to criticize Russia. I am a huge fan of Russian uh, literature, Russian music, Russian contribution to the world civilization. I'm, I'm, I'm Russophile, basically, okay? But we, 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 the problem is that the Eastern Partnership was devised as if it existed in the vacuum, as if there was no counter -East Eastern Partnership program. The Kremlin's neighborhood policy, which had the opposite goals, um, and which, in my view, actually contradicts the long term national interests of Russia. Um, in the absence of tangible soft power, has been aimed at preventing its former colonies, the actually in, in reality, the shared neighborhood with the European Union, from emerging as viable states and God forbid from proper democratic political institutions. Apparently the democracy in its neighborhood scares the Kremlin more than NATO. As for, well, Karabakh, uh, I'm afraid is just one example of Russia's, uh, or rather Kremlin's, neighborhood policy. The conflict was used to keep Russian military presence in the region uh, since the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. First, it helped Armenia to gain control over the Nagorno-Karabakh and adjacent regions, uh, regions, but then did nothing to facilitate any kind of settlement. Um, uh, those who remember the 1999, where well, we all believed that we were close to a breakthrough uh, negotiated by the United States, uh, the Minsk uh, Group co-chairman. Um, I, I was already a, a fairly senior diplomat. I remember how Strobe Talbot visited Moscow, Baku, Yerevan. He flew out and we all expected a big deal to be signed. And then we had terrorist attack in Yerevan parliament. And, and so this should be remembered when uh, sometimes uh, people tend to accuse the West of uh, not trying to, to contribute to the peaceful solution. Um, at the same time, uh, Russia um, then balanced Armenian military support superiority by massive arms sales to Azerbaijan. So uh, in, in reality, uh, Russia wasn't even Armenian's, uh, Armenia's ally. 
And, and there is a sad, no, dark joke uh, saying that in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, Russia always supported the conflict. So when this logically, um, the arms supplies to Azerbaijan, that was also possible um, and Azerbaijan's uh, uh, final uh, military superiority that was achieved, uh, it, it, it became possible through projects like Bakut Pilisi Jehan, uh, we should remember, which Russia was desperate to prevent, when it led to Azerbaijan's military preeminence. And um, uh, the, that include, but is not limited to high tech arms uh, imports from Turkey and Israel and other countries. Well, Russia first stood back. Uh, some argue in order to punish Armenia or Pashinyan and basically for just wanting to leave better, right? And then intervened in the last moment uh, and in reality stealing the um, inevitable victory from Azerbaijan. The result, um, we have a ceasefire, not, not a peace deal. The conflict is not resolved. Um, and But what has happened and what is new is that finally, after many years of trying, the so-called Russian peacekeepers have been uh, sent to Azerbaijan, the only South Caucasus country without Russian military presence. The, I, I say so-called peacekeepers because they have earned certain kind of reputation. Uh, uh, there is a new term in, in, in Russian, as you all know, uh, peacekeepers, uh, word for peacekeepers is Miratvorce. There is a new word, Miratvorce. <laughs> and Georgia knows this story uh, not from anyone else. We have our own uh, story with Russian peacekeepers. There was an older Georgian joke about Russian peacekeepers, which were described not to keep peace, but the peace is of Soviet Union. And this is exactly what they've been doing in Georgia and now and now in Karabakh, I guess. Uh, thank you. So, uh, yes, thank you. So uh, just to complete last sentence, um, uh, from Georgian perspective, any conflict with any outcome in South Caucasus around uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Georgia is usually the first loser. Any peaceful, meaningful settlement will make Georgia the first winner. So we are all for the settlement and peaceful resolution. Thank you. And more greater involvement of the European Union. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, so we move to two, two big countries' representatives, I mean, Turkey and, and Russia. Those in different ways been involved in and are involved in this region, in in particular in Nagorno-Karabakh situation. So I start from Dr. Mitat Celikpala or Celikpala. I don't know. I mean, how to pronounce your name, sir? Uh, I might correct Celik myself. Pala, Good, yeah. Celikpala, who is a professor on, of international relations and vice rector of uh, at uh, Kadir has uh, university. His areas of experience are the Caucasus, uh, North Ca uh, Caucasian diaspora groups, people, and security in the Caucasus and Black Sea regions, Turkish Russian relation. I mean, this is the perfect set, uh, sir, from, uh, to hear from you your assessment on the situation. Uh, uh, what do we have after this settlement? Sir. Thank you, thank you, Petras, and for time to use the time very effectively. I try to be quick and give some bullet points to discuss. Uh, following the 45 days war and the signing of the deal, we have some outcomes in the region. And it's a totally new narrative in the region. All those uh, parties changed their narrative, and therefore we have new aggressive, new newly uh, affected per, uh, countries or people in the region. We have totally almost new strategic context and related with this new strategic context we have a new uh, regional cooperation or the resolution of all those issues and uh, i may easily say that turkey's support is the key to understand what happened in the region uh, last two months and uh, what's the uh, strategic uh, timing of azerbaijani attack we have to consider all those issues by taking those issues into account we need to touch up on the history of the region, as Adela mentioned, and I have some couple of assertions to discuss the issue. 
First of all, the OSCE broker or EU involved negotiations or diplomacy failed in Egypt. This is a reality. And there is a new status quo, secondly. And in this new status quo, we have a new map in the Caucasus. It has changed both literally and figuratively, totally changed. This is also a new uh, uh, geopolitical development in the region. Thirdly, there is a new balance of power in the region. And it seems that Turkey is in the equation, even militarily, for almost the last three decades, you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia does not see any regional actor in its near abroad, its borders. And this is the maybe the first one. Uh, we have Turkish involvement. It's a limited, but it seems that Turkey is in the equation now. Uh, uh, fourthly, related with that, we see unprecedented presidented the assertive Turkish role in the near abroad. This is a, a different factor. We see active assertive Turkey in different regions, and the Caucasus is one of those additions. And fifthly, there is a kind of a Russian impulse ceasefire now, but it is a, just a beginning. More of diplomacy is on the table, and the parties are in need of things and consider all those developments once more. Uh, more than that, Russia has some advantages against Turkey, but Turkey has some leverages as well. Uh, efforts to balance relations with parties while supporting Armenia once kept in the conflict frozen, but it is no longer viable. And the Armenian perspective regarding Russia has changed as well. And from this perspective, is Turkey seeking leverage this conflict for foreign policy gains? Uh, this is a question worth to understand and analyze. Uh, initially, as I said, Turkey and other shares ties and broader relations, referred as one nation and two states. And Ankara remains Baku's key military ally. And Turkey is already supporting Azerbaijan militarily through technical assistance, through arms sales, providing critical support. Uh, especially in terms of armed drones and technical expertise, this is the fact. And all the public opinion in Turkey for the first time support this kind of a uh, very loudly. Uh, but on the other hand, for the negotiations, I have to say that Turkey's interests are aligned with the West uh, in, in the form of changing the status quo to resolve the issue, not with Russia, as Mr. Uh, Varenda mentioned, Russia stays in all those issues, uh, regions, and uh, they don't have the priority to resolve those issues. Why is happened? Because, you know, for the first the erosion of international law and institutions, the environment is hectic and self-help system is working. And this is one case. Uh, and future of the region with the Middle East is a serious concern. And of course, parties shift uh, to a revisionist approach in the region as another. Before taking all those issues into account, I may say some couple of words regarding the EU's role. And Turkey's point, and then wait for questions. First of all, the EU or Europeans are not a part in the peace process, and they do not have any role. This is a concern for the regional actors. It is a concern for Turkey as well. Secondly, there is no sufficient institutional capacity and the political will within the EU itself. This is all a limitation for the EU, and it's very important that we have to take into account. Leila, Leila touched upon a little bit that the identity as a normative actor or factor is not viable and decisive in the resolution of all those issues in the region uh, and setting a well accepted balance in the Caucasus that makes EU as an outsider in all those discussions, despite the fact that he has many projects, projections, and uh, almost two decades uh, relationship with the, the regional countries. Uh, the other one is the EU's member countries conflicting on the uh, understanding regarding Turkey's role in the region, not only in the Caucasus, but in a broader regional area. This is a limitation uh, as well. How to treat Turkey? This is a big question. We see the same stuff in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Black Sea, and other regions. Uh, a new role for the implementation of the ceasefire. There is a role for EU uh, through a dependent monitoring mission, most probably. And the signature of a final agreement is important uh, development that we have to accept. And there is a need of a kind of a whole of engagement. And EU may uh, leverage or, or know how, how to support uh, this final uh, resolution. Uh, as, as my colleagues mentioned, Russian peacekeepers is in region. Uh, most of the time, they never go back to their homes. And this is a concern. Therefore, I see a kind of a role 
in the region uh, and setting a new dialogue mechanism between Armenians and Azerbaijanis and between Armenians and Turks. Turkey, I mean, Armenia and Turkey uh, is a need for a real resolution of the conflict. And the EU has a room or place to play a role in this new equation. Uh, and of course, a financial and economic role is, is a very important IDP, how to restructure, restructure infrastructure and look at the future dire issues. But I strongly support the idea that Turkish-Armenian relations, there is a window of opportunity for, for a new normalization. It's a must for a new beginning, a new thinking. It's not an easy work, but work to invest it. And the EU has uh, an experience and uh, know on this issue. Uh, let me stop here, uh, Petra. Those are the points that I would like to an initial point. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, we will be back into some aspects uh, you already mentioned. And now we move finally to Mr. Yuri Fedorov, who is a, an independent Russian expert specializing in international security and Russia's military affairs. Prior to moving to Europe, he worked as professor at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, a famous one. Fedorov uh, has published extensively on Russian foreign and security policy, arms control, and U.S.-Russia uh, relations. So, Mr. Fedorov, floor is yours. Can you, can you explain us what will be the future in South Caucasus? <laughs> oh, who knows? Uh, anyhow, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I, uh, I thank you, Petros, uh, very, very much for this opportunity uh, for me to share my views on um, on Russia's policy towards uh, the war, the recent war uh, over the Nagorny Karabakh, uh, and of course, I, in no case, I can speak on behalf of uh, any Russian official agency. What I am saying is my own assessments and my own views. So, how it's possible to outline um, Moscow's policy in the region? I think that for more than 20 years, uh, Russia was aimed at maintaining the geopolitical status quo, uh, which emerged as, uh, as a result of the First Karabakh War, War of 1992-94. Moscow capitalized uh, on the conflict and used it to assert its dominant role in, uh, in the region. And with this in view, I think um, the Kremlin implemented a kind of uh, double track policy. On the one hand, Moscow uh, sought to prevent a large scale war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, as such war could lead to significant geopolitical shifts um, in the region. In particular, as a co-chair of the Minsk group, uh, Moscow participated uh, in development of different schemes and uh, proposals aimed at political solution uh, of the conflict, such as uh, the Madrid principles and the like. Yet on the other hand, Rus Russia didn't make any serious efforts, or maybe it didn't make any efforts at all to achieve um, such, uh, such resolution of the conflict. In practice, what is more, it, uh, as uh, it was mentioned here already, it supplied both sides with armaments, which um, which means that it's played some uh, double role. So, since the very beginning of the current war, of the recent war, Moscow has called for a ceasefire, meaning to start some kind of political negotiations with the leading, or at least important, role of Russia as a mediator of such negotiations, yet in vain. Russian military and political leaders um, underestimated three things, I think. First of all, the military power of Azerbaijan. Secondly, Baku's determination to achieve victory and to liberate, if I may say that, the occupied uh, territories. And the third, which was also very important, the importance of Turkish support for Azerbaijan. 
Well, at the same time, uh, Moscow understood that the balance of military forces between Russia on the one uh, side and Turkey and Azerbaijan on the other side didn't allow it to intervene in the war by military means. Such an attempt would have ended in, in the defeat of Russian troops or in extremely uh, dangerous horizontal escalation of armed hostilities over, uh, I think, the whole uh, Black Sea region, which was, uh, in my understanding, unacceptable and which is unacceptable for the Kremlin at the moment. Mm. Well, uh, on the whole, if to, uh, to try to analyze, to try to say something uh, about the current situation after, after the ceasefire, on the whole, Russia suffered a serious defeat in the South Caucasus, in my understanding. Moscow, first of all, Moscow was forced to recognize the new role of Turkey in the region and in the wider international context as a geopolitical actor, at least of the same influence as Russia in those areas. Secondly, uh, Moscow has failed to prevent heavy military and political defeat for its strategic ally, which uh, is Armenia. At the same time, in Armenia and the other uh, state members of the CSTO, doubts are uh, inevitably growing about the correctness, about the efficiency of the strategic orientation towards Russia, towards some uh, military alliance uh, with Russia, uh, and understanding whether Russian uh, guarantees, security guarantees are valid enough. So, um, my last point uh, is that uh, the Russian peacekeeping force in, in Karabakh, which is of uh, 2,000 men in uniform without heavy weapons, is rather symbolic than a real military power. But at the same time, as it was already said here, I absolutely agree with that, it's um, a political tool and there is an important political tool. And in this light, uh, perhaps the EU, the European Union, may take into account that the legal basis of this so-called peacekeeping operation is very weak because there is no uh, formal uh, international treaty uh, on which uh, such operation could be based. The three leaders statement uh, signed in November 9, I do not think that it's uh, enough legal, uh, legal basis for such operation. And perhaps it could be a point, uh, an object of, uh, of discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Fyodorov, for your insights and uh, very interesting conclusions. I mean, both uh, strategic ones as well as uh, legal uh, based. May I ask uh, our three representatives from South Caucasus um, uh, such a question? Well, I mean, we, it was a broad agreement that uh, EU presence uh, was not really felt. I mean, uh, generally speaking, uh, Minsk Group uh, has failed uh, to provide any tangible results. I mean, it, it was simply invisible uh, during the conflict. Uh, very few statements, if any, I mean, absolutely disregarded. I mean, uh, so many years uh, created uh, structure, so much, uh, so much invested uh, expectations, financial resources simply didn't provide any good uh, uh, deed in this regard. But, I mean, the, the, this kind of the European Union profile, above all, uh, no kind of uh, visibility in a, in a solving uh, of conflict, uh, weak presence in Azerbaijan, uh, a bit stronger in Armenia, strong in uh, Georgia. Um, what is the public perception? I mean, how much the public perception has uh, 
changed? Or what uh, could you say about the public perception for the time of being, speaking about the EU as a partner, as a partner for cooperation, as a, even a, a future uh, membership uh, somehow? And secondly, will it help to sustain reforms, social economic reforms in the country? Because European Union, I mean, at least uh, the association agreement uh, of the European Union is Georgia, and Georgia is about reforms, reforming structures, economy, legal system, and bringing it I mean, to the uh, as possible as uh, high level uh, with the European experience and so on. So two points, I mean, public perception and how much, I mean, the present situation taking into account uh, European Union profile and role might support reforms process in your countries. May I start from uh, the opposite uh, uh, sequence, uh, Georgia comes first. Thank you. Well, uh, Georgia is in a different position, I think, from two uh, neighboring countries. We have been a willing uh, student of the European Union, if I may say so. Uh, maybe not uh, always a, a great student, but uh, we've been doing our best um, to a different degree of success. Uh, as I have already said, we have participated in all proposed uh, programs, but, and here I probably won't speak on, on behalf of Georgia, this is my personal opinion, uh, one major problem with the EU and its enormous soft power, which is a huge force for good, is that uh, EU limits itself uh, with soft power and with the approach uh, which ignores the reality of the geopolitics that have returned very firmly, uh, not only in our region. And I, I do understand that uh, EU has no appetite to compete with Russia, let alone to, to have a conflict with Russia. Uh, but here's a problem. And the problem is that, well, while EU wants partnership, well, well partnership requires two willing sides. And I cannot quite see Russia playing the same role. I, uh, many people speak about the new Cold War already. And uh, while conflict uh, can be initiated just by one wise side, um, this is a problem in my view. And, and we see exactly that for a number of years. In South Caucasus uh, specifically, EU could act more actively, not just as a mentor, but as a geopolitical entity uh, with its own national interests. And, and this is what's absent. Uh, in my view, Russia understands uh, the European uh, strategic interests in South Caucasus better than the European Union itself. And for a number of years has been successfully or to different degree of success, has been blocking it from, from its role. And, uh, now the new pattern emerges when Russia supplies uh, weapons to both sides or actually bombs uh, Syria and then says, okay, now European Union can come and pay for the reconstruction. I hope this is not going to be the only role. Of course, the EU has is in a better position to facilitate reconstruction um, in this conflict, including, but I hope it it won't limit its participation just by giving more money and just by giving more advice. South Caucasus has a strategic value for the European interests, and I think the European Union has to pursue those interests. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Padrize. I call on uh, uh, Dr. Stepan Grigorian. Uh, Sir, your, your insights on uh, those two aspects I raised uh, before. Dear Petros, I would just like to clarify one thing. When you said agreements between Armenia and the EU, you said it's economic. It's not just economic, though. It contains very serious reforms touching the Armenian judiciary serious reforms in combating corruption and other reforms. 
the political component of that treaty, of that agreement, is very important. And right now, it's very important to actively engage in these reforms. COVID-19 was a disturbance, uh, but, but the Armenia-EU cooperation has to reach a new paradigm, for which there is a roadmap and there is a treaty basis. Secondly, the European Commission has projects for helping conflict resolution, for building trust. They are called stability instruments, I think. The European Commission could use that in this new uh, reality. The European Commission could do many more projects, not just one project a year, because there is already a foundation. Armenians and Azerbaijanis could already start having some contacts, people-to-people -people contacts and track two contacts and uh, NGOs and civil societies could start engaging in these contacts. So it's very important. And this is an area where MEPs could start discussing those possibilities. Then the next question is, when will the EU reinstate itself in the OSC Minsk group via France? France represents also the EU. For that to happen, you need to take specific steps regarding the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. And that only after that will Russia and Turkey respect you. You cannot send your troops. Russians and Turkey could send troops. Russia could send troops and Turkey could send troops to support Azerbaijan. You could provide political support. But in the Madrid principles, there is mention of the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. And you should... Uh, flag this part and provide for a an interim status after that you will be reckoned with petras asked about armenians well armenians and the public opinion public opinion is good but they don't see a role for you either a political role or a role in enforcement but you could have a political role a final comment on russia russia really did not support Armenia as its ally actively. Armenia in international organizations always voted the way Russia wanted Armenia to vote. In the UN and the Council of Europe, there are lots of examples and I will not go to these examples. But here Russia didn't support Armenia actively. And I agree with the Russian expert who said, in post-Soviet space, people will start reconsidering their trust and their relationship to Russia in post-Soviet space, because everyone understands that Russia could uh, betray or hand in its allies. I don't want it to sound too sharp, but the impression is Russia did not actively support Armenia. So Russia's goal was to bring in its troops and not to support its ally. And that, of course, uh, will affect Russia's image in post-Soviet space. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Grigorian, and uh, I call on uh, Madame Aliyeva to present uh, Azerbaijan point of view. Yes. Oh, okay. I would like to stress that I'm not representing the official Azerbaijani view because I'm in Oxford, so I'm more uh, in my capacity as an independent expert. But I can basically describe uh, what is also the concern of Azerbaijani view. First of all, I would say that uh, with all this tragic co um, cost which we had to pay for this uh, war, both parties, it has, I think, three at least consequences, results, which might uh, kind of uh, be used as a platform for the resolution of the conflict. I mean, first is the shattering the Russia's security domination in the region. Um, second, undermining the dependency syndrome. That's very important because the frozen conflict actually also froze the uh, dependence syndrome on the regional actor, in particularly in our neighbors, um, reliance on the regional actor in its uh, policy with the, uh, in the neighborhood. 
So that undermined it. Um, and the third one, it basically showed the futility of the dependence syndrome or reliance on the regional actor. And it's also undermined the military sort of romanticism, which I used to call, because very often I would hear that, you know, this military gains their uh, very important and things like that. So it undermined, it showed that it's very provisional and it's very temporary. So the you can't really achieve long-lasting solution under military pressure. You should find the mutually beneficial uh, solution. And I think this, I think the awareness of Russia's role in the region in both societies uh, can be used now to bring them closer because both of them are disappointed uh, uh, and are unhappy with Russia's role in this region. So they can be united by something, although it sounds a bit negative. But on the other hand, it may bring to a greater awareness of uh, the sense of interdependence rather than dependency syndrome the dependence that you have to regulate the relationship with your neighbor based on certain, you know, mutual uh, benefits and compromises. And the, 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 in this regard, I think EU roles, a role should be not a, that of patron replacing Russia, but rather the actor who would reinforce this sense of personal individual responsibility of the country to think about how they're going to uh, cooperate in the future or even now with their neighbor uh, is first. Second, they can bring the awareness that the uh, security paradigm is also something which is outdated and it's used by Russia. It's been utilized by Russia based purely on the constructive threats historical grievances, constructed threats. It can help the countries to take their uh, the issue of their relationship to the other level, from the pre uh level to the level of globalized uh, world, uh, increasingly virtualized, when the physical direct control over territory is not what... Uh, uh, constitutes the power of the country. The power of the country is about the human resources, it's about IT, it's about the capacity of the, you know, develop mobilized resources rather than extract them. So I think it uh, can be very important a contribution of the EU. And as I said earlier, the normative presence of EU is extremely important. It has a lot of institutions like Hague Tribunal or other courts, international courts, and I think all should be tried. I think that it should be utilized as well. Thank you, Madame Aliyeva, for your uh, insights. Uh, and may I ask, I mean, to uh, uh, our representatives from, uh, um, from uh, Russia and uh, Turkey, starting from um, Yuri Fedorov. Uh, uh, do you think that Russia was ready? I mean, Kremlin was ready for such an advancement of Turkey in the uh, South Caucasus region. I mean, we have to take into consideration that Turkey uh, is a member of NATO, is having the biggest army, uh, European army uh, within NATO forces, and its uh, weaponry and uh, military organization has proved uh, superiority. In any case, I mean, the Azeri, uh, Azerbaijan army looked absolutely different. I mean, different technologies and the rest. So, from this perspective, uh, wasn't it a, a, a surprise for Kremlin, I mean, to see a new emerging uh, power directly at the borders of Russia? That's quite right. <clears throat> I, I'm sure that... Uh, according to analysis of Russian mass media uh, during the war, it was um, almost clear that the Kremlin and uh, Russia's uh, foreign office, they were shocked uh, and unprepared for such developments. They called for um, uh, ceasefire and so on, yet uh, they didn't know how to achieve it they made a lot of um, mis, 
uh, missed and the biased assessments of the situation, especially in military terms, they were not ready uh, for appearance of Azerbaijan uh, as a much more uh, powerful uh, military force. So for, I think, for three first weeks of, of the war, uh, uh, the Kremlin and uh, all other Russian uh, governmental agencies, they, uh, they expected that uh, the war will stop or terminate it, uh, almost uh, the same shocky situation uh, in which no, uh, no side uh, will or would, uh, would uh, prevent, would uh, achieve a victory. Uh, and now, and now uh, I think that uh, the Kremlin was more or less successful when uh, in saving the face, but the face itself is not uh, looking so good uh, from the Kremlin point of view as it was before. Uh, the Kremlin now, the Kremlin's role now is much, uh, or Russia's role now, if you wish, is much, uh, is not so so important, is not so uh, powerful as it was before. Uh, Russia is uh, enforced to uh, accept accept Turkey as as um, equal power, I would say, which, in my understanding, provide uh, the countries in the region with more freedom of maneuver. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's uh, favorable conditions for them for uh, implement their uh, more independent policy. Thank you. Thank you. I move to uh, Professor Chilipkala uh, asking him uh, uh, with this uh, kind of shift uh, towards uh, increased Turkish uh, influence in the region. One might uh, think about that even the title of Minsk Group might be probably changed to Istanbul Group. <laughs> if, the, if the Minsk Group is not uh, deciding uh, things, maybe we should uh, look for different actors. So in this regard, uh, Professor, my, my question is, is Turkey ready to assume much bigger responsibility over the region? Uh, my answer is yes, in fact. You know, Turkey is not a new actor in the region. If you look at the last decade, you see Turkey as, as a, uh, a big investor within the region through establishing trilateral relations with Georgia and, and Azerbaijan. And we already have all those road uh, rail lines, road lines, any kind of an air connection. And, and we have a middle corridor that links to the region. To that, in fact, uh, Europeans and the European Union invested too much in all those projects, despite the fact that Europeans lost their interest or they investing less and less day by day. Turkey is continuing all those uh, infrastructures. And, you know, all those infrastructures are open to Armenia for all last decade and many intentions, unless uh, the occupied territories are liberated. Under the current circumstances, it seems that all those areas are now liberated and we are going to go through a, a, a sustainable peace deal uh, to resolve all those issues related with the Karabakh and between Armenia region and Armenia and Turkey. Uh, therefore, there is a room for Turkey to play a kind of a car, card, not only a military card, but, you know, to resolve uh, the, the, the issue from a constructive perspective. I don't know whether there is a kind of an Istanbul uh, group or not, but you know, uh, Turkey is the part. That is the necessity to see the Turk to see Turkey on the to discuss all those issues. By the by the way, I would like to remind you as well that Turkey acted as if a Western a Western actor, EU negotiating partner within the region, together with Western actors. Turkey was against the status quo for three decades, uh, normalized the region. Russia was the actor, and beyond that. Last couple of years, Turkey and Russia had experience uh, to work on some issues, not only in the Caucasus, but in areas as well. Uh, both parties do not have the same interest at the end, 
they are not expecting the same answer to the resolving of all those issues, but they manage to work together on some issues. Of course, this is a kind of a know-how for Turkey, and it opens a room for Turkish uh, involvement in all those uh, issues in different regions as well as in the Caucasus. Uh, of course, there are some limitations because this is not an institutional kind of a relationship. This is person to person, leader to leader relationship. And this is the role of Europeans, I, I, just, I guess, that they may play to, to have much more constructive uh, role for Turkey in line with Azerbaijan's expectations as well as Armenia's expectations. Because, you know, we have very strong challenge in the front of us to normalize the lives of people in the region, on the area, in Karabakh region, and in Azerbaijanis as well, Azerbaijani Turks as well. They are uh, going to go back to their places. And Armenians who would like to live under the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh territory, they need to rewrite a new narrative, a very constructive kind of narrative. This narrative must be based on peaceful features, and we may play a role in this game. I mean Turkey, and to the European support, we can do it. And for the first time, uh, Russia agreed Turkey's role, involvement in this region. Therefore, this is also a constructive uh, aspect of those relations uh, or those developments in the region. Thank you, Professor. I mean, at the very end, so we have uh, very few minutes left, I will ask each of you a question and uh, I would expect a reply in one word on just one sentence. What we should expect in the one year time? Imagine we have 2021, November, end of November. So what the word as a symbol about the situation in the region comes to your mind automatically? May we start from uh, top down, uh, Madame uh, Aliyeva? No, no sound. Yes. Uh yes. I would express this in one, one word, a uh, high risk of instability. Thank you. Uh, Monsieur, uh, Monsieur Grigorian? I think Russian-Turkish tension growing. Thank you. Besides, uh, besides but, Azerbaijan's sovereignty will face problems. That's over. Thank you. Ambassador Padridze? Uh, I, I too don't think that the current situation is sustainable. This is not peace and this is not a settlement. We need dramatic changes. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Tselipkala? I, I just hope constructive cooperation and, 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 and to write a new narrative. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Fedorov, what is your one word? I think it will be stable and stability. <laughs> Well, I hope, I mean, your replies would be more optimistic, but uh, I think you, you bear a very reasonable and responsible assessment on the situation, which is not really promising. And still, there are many parts of, uh, you know, burning uh, um, parts of this story, not really distinguished. So I thank you all of you as speakers of this online debate which for me was very interesting. We, we had so many different opinions from different countries. I mean, countries in uh, particularly attracted to this uh, issue. And I'm looking forward, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to continue with you uh, on different uh, platforms, debates. Uh, and of course, I mean, all our prayers and um, hopes go for more stability in that region. I mean, people need that stability and they deserve that stability. Let's do our utmost, I mean, to bring a better Christmas uh, to that uh, part of the world as well. I thank you once again and goodbye.